Well, welcome to St. Peter's Online. We're so glad that you're with us today. My name is Xavier, and whether you know Jesus or not, or whether you're just here investigating things or interested, warm welcome to you. In a moment, you will hear the Bible read and then explain. We firmly believe here at St. Peter's that God speaks to us today through his life-giving word. And my prayer is this will help you to know him or to know him better. Enjoy following along. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we pray that you will speak to us and that we can learn and grow from your truth this morning. Amen. The first reading from the Old Testament is from Amos chapter 1, verses, uh, sorry, starting at chapter 1 through to verses, chapter 2, verse 3. Amos chapter 1. The words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, the vision he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake, when Isaiah was king of Judah, and Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, was king of Israel. He said, The Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds dry up and the top of Carmel withers. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not relent. Because she threshed Gilead with sledges having iron teeth, I will send fire on the house of Haziel that will consume the fortress of Ben-Hadad. I will break down the gate of Damascus. I will destroy the king who is in the valley of Avon and the one who holds the scepter in Beth Eden. The people of Aram will go into exile to Kerr, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Gaza, even for four, I will not relent. Because she took captive whole communities and sold them to Edom, I will send fire on the walls of Gaza that will consume her fortresses. I will destroy the king of Ashdod and the one who holds the scepter in Ashkelon. I will turn my hand against Ekron till the last of the Philistines are dead, says the sovereign Lord. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Tyre, even for four, I will not relent. Because she sold whole communities of captives to Edom, disregarding a treaty of brotherhood, I will send fire on the walls of Tyre that will consume her fortresses. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Edom, even for four, I will not relent. Because he pursued his brother with a sword and slaughtered the women of the land, because his anger raged continually and his fury flamed unchecked, I will send fire on Timon that will consume the fortresses of Bosra. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Ammon, even for four, I will not relent. Because he ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead in order to extend his borders, I will set fire to the walls of Rabbah that will consume her fortresses amid war cries on the day of battle, amid violent winds on a stormy day. Her king will go into exile, he and his officials together, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says, for three sins of Moab, even for four, I will not relent. Because he burned to ashes the bones of Edom's king, I will send fire on Moab that will consume the fortress of Kerioth. Moab will go down in great tumult amid war cries and the blast of the trumpet. I will destroy her ruler and king, kill all her officials with him, says the Lord. Matthew chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. 
the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you. And more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth. Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. He who has ears, let him hear. Um, when I was in high school, uh, we had a geography teacher who was kind but naive. Uh, she was kind but naive, and I remember one of my friends being told off by this teacher, being told off for lying, and the teacher said, you lied. Uh, you shouldn't have done that. Um, you lied. I'm of a mind to punish you. I'm of a mind to give you a detention today. And my friend, cheeky fellow that he was, he said, ma'am, 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 ma'am. No, no, it, it wasn't a lie. No, it wasn't a lie. It was just a fabrication. <laughs> now, this teacher didn't know what the word fabrication meant. <laughs> and so she pulled herself up and she went, oh, okay, all right, that's okay then. Off you go. <laughs> and uh, she didn't know that fabrication actually was just a big word for lie. And she was obviously too embarrassed to ask, and so she dropped the punishment. So she completely misunderstood what was going on in that interaction, and she responded as a result inappropriately. Who'd want to be that teacher? No, nah, none of us would want to be like that. We want to understand things, don't we? We want to understand what's going on with others, and that's really important. Well, today in the passage where had read to us from Matthew's Gospel, we're thinking about misunderstanding and understanding. Misunderstanding and understanding, it's really important in our relationships, human relationships, even more important when it comes to God and what he's doing in the world. Uh, we've got to clear away misunderstandings and have a right understanding, otherwise we might miss out on eternal significant things like being part of his kingdom. Now, as Andy mentioned already, today we're picking up our reading of the gospel that was written by Matthew of Jesus' life. Last year in term one, we paused our reading, but casting our mind back to that, I don't suspect that you remember, but let me give you a very quick recap. Last year, we saw Jesus' extraordinary authority over all things, over people, over nature, over the demon world, over sicknesses and things like that. And then Jesus sent out his 12 disciples, his 12 followers, to go, go and preach the kingdom. Help me in that. Preach that the kingdom of heaven is near. And he taught his disciples what to expect along the way, that there will be some people who respond positively but it's also going to be in the context of sometimes opposition, sometimes even violent opposition. So today we're going to be continuing that reading, and at the end of this talk I'm going to put a question to you about understanding that I suspect nobody has ever asked you before. A question that nobody has ever asked you before. You can tell me afterwards if they have or not. And it will tell you whether you are close to God's kingdom or not. Have I got you intrigued? 
Yeah, some of you. <laughs> it's my little hope, little bait there to keep you listening. So we're going to think of, be thinking about understanding God's kingdom and misunderstanding it, and we're going to do it through two lenses. We're going to do it through the lens of John the Baptist, and we're going to do it through the lens of the crowd who were impacted by John the Baptist. So let's get into it. First theme, misunderstanding. And we're turning to John the Baptist because he misunderstood things, I think. And through his misunderstanding, he risked to be offended by Jesus, to be offended by him, to start having doubts about Jesus, maybe even to have his whole faith to rocked and chucked away. And we can be like that. If we misunderstand things, we can be offended by Jesus or the Christian faith, even walk away. And we don't want that. We don't want to misunderstand. So you've got your Bible there, chapter 11, verse 1. I'll pick up the reading. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and to preach in the towns of Galilee, that's up north of the land of Palestine. When John, this is John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, the Christ, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one? Are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? So no doubt John had still access to his disciples who were following him and he was able from prison to send his disciples to Jesus. And so here we have God's prophet, John, in prison and he's not sure about Jesus. He's not sure about him. He's not sure if he is actually the Messiah, that he is the Christ. He has doubts that are throwing him here. Now, before we see Jesus' reaction to John's doubts, I think it's worth reflecting on how this is just so culturally different to what happens in a nation like Australia. Um, in our nation, we don't have prophetic expectations. Uh, we just don't have that. Or if you go to New Zealand, they don't have prophetic expectations. Or you can pick another nation. We go to Russia. They don't have prophetic expectations. Why? Because they don't have God's prophets speaking to them. They don't have that. But Israel did. I think Israel is unique in my, my point of view, unique in human history, they had God speaking to them through prophets, setting up all these expectations, prophetic ex expectations of judgment to come, but also of a kingdom that God would restore and of his kingdom coming. And so John is in a long line of prophets like Moses and Elijah and Jeremiah who suffered actually bringing God's word to his rebellious people, but who did that brought the word and you know what back then in Jesus's time John has been declaring that God's kingdom is breaking in I'll get you to flip to chapter 3 of Matthew's gospel we'll see that in verse 1 John he's been out in the wilderness of Judea which is down the south and this is his basic message to the nation he's been saying repent Turn back, in other words, to God. Why? For the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, has come near. That was his message. And so John set up, because he was a prophet, he set up expectations of what's going to happen. Here's some of the things that he said to the nation. He said, uh, down in uh, verse 11 of that chapter, he said, I'm going to baptize, I've been baptizing you with water, you know, as a sign of forgiveness of sins, turning back to God. But you know what? One after me comes who is more powerful than I am. Whose sandals I'm not even worthy to carry. I'm not even worthy to be his, his slave. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He's got his winnowing fork in his hand. He will clear his uh, threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into his barn and he will burn up the chaff um, with unquenchable fly, fire. So here John is setting up expectations of this one to come, Jesus, who would gather God's people together and he would judge those who refuse to repent and he would judge 
the corrupt and the evil. Yet here's the thing. The thing that's difficult for John. He's in prison. That's where he is. He's suffering. He's been put in prison by a corrupt leader in the nation, Herod. And John's been preaching the kingdom, and in that preaching, he's denouncing the leadership, the corrupt leadership, like Herod. But you know what's happening? No judgment's coming. It's not coming. He's Herod, corrupt king, he's still in his palace. He's in his fine livery, and he's prancing around doing whatever he wants. But John is in prison. God's prophet is in prison. And he hears about Jesus. He hears about all these people flocking to him. That seems like the ingathering, doesn't it? That sounds like the wheat being brought into the barn. But where's the justice? Where's the justice? Where's the fire? For Herod, at least. Where is this judgment on evil? And so here's John starting to have doubts about Jesus. We all can, can't we? Especially when things are tough in life. We go, really? Well, Jesus replies. See his reply? Have a look at verse 4. Jesus says to John's disciples, go back. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk again. Those who have leprosy, they're cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. Wow. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is the one who does not stumble, or you could translate, who does not fall away, or who is not offended on account of me. And so John had doubts. You would, wouldn't you? I would, if I was in prison. But Jesus says to John, John, look. Look at the signs. That's what you, I want you to do. Consider the signs. Think about the expectations. Think about the prophetic expectations through the prophets, like Isaiah, for instance, writing 600 years before. This is what Isaiah wrote. Be strong. Don't, do not fear. Your God will come. And when he comes, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. The lame will leap like a deer for joy. The mute of those who cannot speak will speak again and shout for joy. And all these things were happening with Jesus. And so I think Jesus is saying to John, look at the prophetic expectations, John. Look at Isaiah. God's kingdom is indeed breaking in. And you put two, what is it, two and two together. And what should you deduce? What should have John deduced? Oh, okay, the, he is the one. He's got to be the one. There's no other explanation. Now, I don't know how John processed all this in his suffering in prison. Maybe he did put two and two together and go, okay, you are the one. The signs are there. You've got to be the one. I believe you. I trust you. you I don't understand. I don't understand why Herod hasn't got the chop yet. I don't understand why the fire hasn't come yet. I don't understand why the judge... But you've got to be the one. And I'm going to trust you in that. I don't know. I've got no idea how he thought about this. Maybe he thought about it like that. So perhaps John was expecting kind of the ingathering of the kingdom, all the people coming into the kingdom, and the judgment and the fire happening at the same time, in the same week or in the same month or the same year, all one big shebang. But you know what? The New Testament goes on to teach us what's really happening the ingathering is happening in the world today. The kingdom has broken in. People all throughout the globe in countries all around the world are turning to Jesus as king. The kingdom is advancing. But we also know the judgment is yet to come. The fire is yet to come. So what John put together, the New Testament teaches us, actually have been separated. So I think John's expectations in his mind needed modifying so that he would hang on to his faith and not let go of Jesus being the King, the Messiah, who will eventually restore all things. Now before we get into our next point, 
I think having right expectations in relationships, that's really important, isn't it? In, in, in our human relationships, that's really valuable. And it's having the right expectations in regards to the Lord, in regards to God, that's very valuable, even more valuable, actually, so that we don't have doubts and fall away because we've just put wrong expectations on this whole Christian faith thing. Um, I'll give you an example. Libby and I, my wife and I, in our marriage, we struggled in our first year or two because of my misplaced expectations. We did marriage prep before we got married, and the senior minister said, Libby, you've got realistic expectations. You know what he said to me? Say, so you've got glasses. You know what colour they are? They're rose. They're rose. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought he was wrong. Anyway. But I noticed in our marriage... I used to think, for whatever reason, if, if Libby did something and I was offended by what she did, I didn't understand what was going or whatever, do you know what I used to do? I used to just get grumpy. That's what I'd get. I'd get grumpy. I'd stop talking, stonewalling, all that kind of thing. And my expectation was she could work it out. That's what I thought, you know. She knows me now, what, for seven years. We were dating seven years. And anyway, she can work it out. She knows what's going on, what's wrong. And she got so, she tore out her hair. I'm so grateful that, thanks, Liv, for being so patient. <laughs> she said, Dave, you've got to talk. You've got to, you've got to express it. You've got to tell me what's going on. I had wrong expectations of how our marriage was going to work. And I've learned over the years to say how I feel. And it's been really helpful. The same is true of the Christian faith in our relationship with Jesus. We can have all sorts of misplaced expectations about him as Lord and what's going on in the world. And if we have misplaced expectations, what's, go what's going to happen for us? It's going to be a problem in the relationship. We might even start doubting him. We might even drop the whole thing full away. I've got some questions here for you, and we're going to play a sort of a game of true and false, okay? You can call out true or false. <laughs> It's, this is not going to bring us comfort, but hopefully it will help us to start thinking about this issue and ground us and go, you know what, even if I don't understand Jesus, I'm going to hold on to you. So here's some questions for you, true or false. Let me know what you think. Following Jesus will make life easier. False. There we go. Enough people to know. <laughs> That's marvellous having hope that we can pray to him and he helps us. But actually, if you become a Christian, I don't know if you're a follower of Jesus yet, 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 sometimes it can become harder. Division in the family. People will start persecuting you. Not always the case. Here's another one. Following Jesus will mean you will always be healed. We die. That's not the case. Following Jesus will mean my marriage will automatically go from strength to strength. False. There's nothing automatic about it. I had to work. Libby and I had to work on our marriage. You know, God says we've got to put off certain stuff. Sin, we've got to put on. You've got to work on it. It's not automatic. Following Jesus will mean my children will follow him. I wish it was the other way. <laughs> I really do. I really do. But the Lord hasn't promised us that. We pray. Pray for his mercy. Following Jesus will mean I get through my exams. Oh, there's a laugh. Let's move on. Uh, <laughs> following Jesus will mean I'll find a partner for life. False. Following Jesus will mean he will transform me more and more into his likeness. True, he has promised that. Marvellous. Following Jesus will mean he will never leave me. True, he has promised that. Following Jesus will mean I am deeply loved. True, he has promised that. Following Jesus will mean he will take me home into his presence one day. True. You know, having right expectations is vital in the Christian faith. John had, I think, misplaced expectations. A great prophet. We can too. And the only way of getting this right is knowing God's promises to us and clinging to those. Do you know all of God's promises? No, probably don't. Do I know them all? No, I don't. And so we need to grow to understand what has God promised and what he hasn't promised. And one of the marvellous things about coming to church together is like this, is that me, even if I don't know all the promises, you don't know all the promises, as we come together and we talk to each other and we struggle through the stuff of life, we cling to those promises he's made and we clear out those misunderstandings or expectations that we shouldn't have and so we grow 
And we do that as we read God's word. So keep coming, keep talking to each other about our Christian faith in the ups and downs so that we have right expectations and cling to our king. So that's the first point. Jesus having sought to clear up misunderstandings for John, Jesus now turns to the crowds who had been impacted by John's powerful ministry. So we're going to think about ourselves now through the uh, lens of the crowd. And so we're coming up to understanding. Just like John needed misunderstanding cleared away, the crowds needed understanding to respond appropriately. Just like that teacher I told you about at the beginning needed understanding of the word, uh, what was it? Fabrication (laughs) to respond appropriately. We do too. We need understanding to respond to the kingdom. So Jesus talks to the crowd about John the Baptist. Have a look at verse 7. See verse 7 there? As Jesus' disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? So here Jesus is speaking about an experience that this crowd has already had. Uh, They didn't go to a Taylor Swift concert or a Troy Cassadaly concert. They went out into the wilderness. They've all done this, right? They went into the wilderness to see this man, John. In fact, thousands upon thousands of people in Israel did this in the nation. It would be like the whole of Tamworth heading to Upper Horton. Anybody know where Upper Horton is? Yeah, Barab. Yay! (laughs) We've got some Barabites here, so they're they're happy about that. Um, It would have been like us heading Tamworth, heading up to a little creek up in Upper Horton somewhere to hear some preacher guy. But it wasn't just Tamworth, it was Armidale and Gunnedah and Nundal and Woolaman. In the nation, people flocked from everywhere out into the wilderness to see this guy John and be baptised by him and hear him. This was a significant national event. And Jesus gets the crowd to think about it. He goes... What in the world were you doing going out there in the wilderness? What did you go out to see? Was it a reed swayed by the wind? I don't know if that's a tourist attraction or whatever. (laughs) Out in the desert, oh, look at that reed by the little bit of water. That's marvellous. We spent two days going on that trip. (laughs) Photos back home on... (laughs) I don't know if this is humour on the part of Jesus... Um, It could be implying that John was no pushover. He challenged the leadership. He called out corruption. He seemed fearless. He called the religious establishment, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, a brood of vipers. (laughs) He wasn't some weak reed. So what did you go out to see, Jesus said? Was it some important guy in designer suits? Gucci, Prada. R.M. Williams boots. Sorry for all those who wear R.M. <laughs> you know, John was different. He wore camel's clothing. That was kind of, I don't know whether that was a coat for the cold winter nights. He didn't touch alcohol. He ate locusts and honey. He was different. Um, his father, Zachariah, was a, he was a priest in the temple back in the big smoke in the city. Uh, his father, in his duties, would have worn fine livery. Can you imagine Zachariah's colleagues at work going, Zachariah, what's the thing with your son? <laughs> he's, he's out in the desert doing his thing there, calling people to repentance, you know. That was what John the Baptist was doing. He had a massive impact on the nation. And because Jesus says, well, what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, a prophet. Many people in the nation back then considered John a prophet. They considered that God was speaking to them through John. Momentous occasion. But Jesus wants the crowd to go one step further in their understanding. One step further. Have a look at verse 9. A prophet, yes, but more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written in, that is, in the prophets, like Malachi, I will send my messenger ahead of you, in other words, ahead of the Lord, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I tell you, 
among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. So Jesus is saying here that John, he's more than a prophet. He is the goat of all prophets. What's goat mean? Greatest of all time. I wish that camel could do that thing, but anyway. Greater than Moses, greater than Elijah, greater than Jeremiah. Why? Because he is the forerunner of God coming. He is the forerunner to the kingdom breaking open. He is the forerunner to God's great king arriving. All the prophetic expectation in the nation were about to find fulfillment. He is the last great prophet who opens up that great day of the Lord of salvation and judgment that we are in now. That day when God would gather in his people like wheat into a barn and at the end of the day he would judge with fire. So in verse 14... Jesus says, quoting the prophet Malachi, John is Elijah. He's like the great prophet Elijah, the second Elijah to come. If you are willing to accept it, accept it. Now, before we think about how this might apply to us, um, a couple of interesting things here. Have a look at verse 11. Can you see verse 11? Where Jesus says, the least of those in the kingdom of heaven or in the kingdom of God are greater than John. Wow. Can I just say to you, if you put your trust in Jesus, you're a follower of Jesus, you know where you are or where you belong. You are a member of God's kingdom. You belong to the kingdom now. And so this means that you are greater than John the Baptist. And you go, how can that be? Well, two things in regards to this. You are in the kingdom spiritually whereas john was announcing the breaking in of the kingdom hadn't been inaugurated yet that's the first thing second thing is you have a prophetic message greater than the greatest prophet ever you can point to not only having the king come but you can point to the fact that the king died for our sins he was raised to new life and will return you me we have a prophetic message greater than the greatest prophet of the old testament extraordinary what should we do with it we should tell people that's what we should do the other curious thing is verse 12 notice verse 12 jesus says from the days of john the baptist until now the kingdom has been forcefully advancing or you could translate it has been subjected to violence and violent people have been raiding it Basically, this is describing how the kingdom breaks in and advances. It will advance. God's made sure of it. Jesus said, I will build my church. It's going to happen. But it advances in the context of violent opposition. And we've seen that at the beginning of John uh, John the Baptist's ministry up until Jesus. Herod is an example of that violent opposition to what God is doing. So what are we to do with all this? John being a prophet, the greatest of all prophets. Um, What are we to do with it for us? Well, where to do with it, what Jesus does with it. What does Jesus want out of this? Jesus wants the crowds to accept who John is. Why? Well, if you accept who John is, what's the next step? You'll accept who Jesus is. You start to believe in John, you start to believe in Jesus. You know, Joseph, Joseph, uh, Josephus, uh, Flavius Josephus, was a Jewish historian writing very close to the time of Jesus. He wasn't favourable to Christianity. In his writings, he mentions a whole lot of things. Actually, we've got mentions of Jesus in his writings outside of the Bible. He also mentions John the Baptist and mentions that Herod had him imprisoned. The majority of historians today, whether they're believers or not, accept this to be fact, that we are dealing with historical facts here. So I'm going to put a question to you that nobody, I suspect, has ever put to you in your whole life. Who do you think John the Baptist is? Funny question, isn't it? 
Has anybody put that to you? I don't know. You might say, I don't care. Don't care. But what if he is a prophet? What if God actually spoke in the world to a nation through prophets? Could God even do that? Did God do that? This is one of the foundations of the Christian faith. God has spoken. He has spoken to us through the prophets. And in these last days, this great last day, he has spoken to us through his son. You know, as Christians, we're often, we want to ask people, who do you think Jesus is? I'm asking you here this morning, who do you think John the Baptist is? If you think he could be a prophet, or that he is a prophet, that God was speaking through him, you know what? You are very close to the kingdom, if not in it. So who do you think he is? Well, how you respond to John the Baptist will tell you how you respond to Jesus. And we're going to think about responding to Jesus more next week. How about I pray? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a speaking God. Many of us here believe, I believe, that you spoke powerfully through your prophets to your people that you chose. And you spoke through John the Baptist to prepare us for your great king and his kingdom. Pray, Father, for any here today who are wrestling with these things, that you might bring them to a conviction that you do speak in the world, you have spoken and you are speaking, that you might bring them into your kingdom. And we pray, Father, as next week, as we think about how we respond to Jesus, that you'd help us to respond, with, not with misunderstanding, but understanding in a way that brings glory to you. Amen. Well, I hope that was helpful for you. Uh, here at St. Peter's, we consider ourselves to be God's dearly loved children. We're passionate for him, and we desire for everyone to know Jesus and to grow in him. And we have so many activities around that for toddlers, children, youth, uh, young adults, adults and more. Feel free to drop in anytime at one of our gatherings at 8 a.m. is kind of more traditional service, 10 a.m. or 4 p.m. We have children's programs or 6 p.m. Uh, in the evening, that's followed by dinner. You'd be more than welcome. If you'd like to know more about Jesus, we'd love to help you. We do a series called Hope, and you can meet new people. Or if you'd like to join St. Peter's, uh, we have a special series called Belong, which can help you find your feet. So let us know. You can text us on 0466 200 791. I'll repeat that for our radio listeners, 0466 200 791. Or you can use the QR code, which we'll leave up for the next minute or so, Enjoy your week.